Council of Clean Energy Audit and Finance Committee meeting. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order and ask Nellie if she can do a roll call. Great. I want to state your jurisdiction. If you'll please state your name. Burlingame. Donna Colson. East Palo Alto. Carlos Romero. Portola Valley. Jeff Elfs. Sam Bruno. Marty Medina. Director Emeritus. Uh, John Keener. And Director Emeritus. Okay, we have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelly. At this point in the meeting, um, I'm going to um, open the meeting up for any public comment to any items that are not on the regular agenda. I don't know if I have any public. I'm just going to take a look at our participants. Pull that link up real fast here. Um, I don't see any public comment or any hands raised. Nelly, did we have anything come in through the internet? No, we've not had any submitted comments. Okay, fantastic. Then I'm going to go ahead and move um, and see if I can get uh, one of my colleagues to please make an action to set the agenda and approve the consent agenda items. So, okay, I'll take a motion by Marty Medina and I think a second by Jeff Alves. Yep. Great. Roll call, please, Nelly. Burlingame? Yes. East Palo Alto? Yes. Portola Valley? Yes. San Bruno? Yes. And the motion passes. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. Since um, we don't really have a permanent chair, I don't really have a chair report, but um, if anyone else has anything they'd like to make a comment on, we can do it now. Um, we have those member reports at the end, but um, that is really it. So we'll, we'll just go ahead and any Anything that anybody wants to put under the chair report, since we don't have one, I'm going to open it to everyone. All right. Uh, any public comment under chair report? Doesn't look like any. All right. We'll move on to item number two, staff report discussion. I believe that would be Christina. Is she want to go ahead and take the mic, Christina? Yes. And let me also take the screen. And um, you know, I'll see okay here. Yes, yes. Perfect. Good morning, everybody. Um, good to be with everyone this morning at our audit and finance committee meeting. Um, let us go into our agenda, we've already gone through call to order, public comment, action to set the agenda, um, no chair report and no staff report. So the three items um, for discussion on our agenda today are the fiscal year 2022-23 Q2 financial report, um, item number four, um, a discussion on the projected impact of the 2-1 PCE rate change on the current fiscal year end results. Um, and then the uh, number six item on the agenda is a discussion on budget variances, um, a, a, a framework to discuss budget variances that we'll see um, here on this report, as well as um, future budget variances. And then the last item is committee members report. So getting into the first um, item of substance here, um, the 2022-23 Q2 financial report. This is our um, year to date uh, reporting on financials through Q2. So this covers our um, financial results from July 1, 2022 through December 31, 2022, six months um, over the fiscal year. Um, and we'll start off high level. Um, we'll start off on details that build up to the full um, snapshot and picture. And when looking at our overall financial health, um, really starting off at load performance, um, how much uh, of energy have we sold and how are we tracking to budget? So from a high level perspective in the current fiscal year with six months under our belt, our total loads year to date, uh, so through Q2, July through December, are 1.3% below budget total. 
Um, you can break that down further into commercial and industrial loads and residential loads for the sake of simplicity. And you can see that commercial and industrial loads are just at budget or slightly ahead where we are tracking at 0.85% of commercial and industrial loads to our budget uh, for the first six months of the year. And then on the residential side, we are tracking below budget with residential loads 4% um, below uh, budget through Q2 of this year. Let me uh, move into, well, you have our load picture and how we're performing to budget. Um, let's go into revenues. What does this mean? Um, here you have a picture of our revenues, year-to-date actuals uh, versus budget broken out by month, and then also a history of where we've been over the last uh, 13 months. So you get a sense of um, what things looked like in the um, prior uh, six months period. Um, on our revenue picture, year-to-date revenues is $5.4 million below budget or 2% under our year-to-date budget. Again, with six months under our belt. And if you look at you know, the revenue picture, we started off with loads. You have loads that are uh, under budget and uh, you know, multiply that by the rates that we're charging for our electricity. Um, as you saw on the prior slide, our revenue under performance is driven mostly by residential loads at revenues um, uh, coming in under budget. Can I ask a, a quite quick question on that one, um, yeah. please? Christina. So do you think that um, the, 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 you know, we've had a pretty cold winter, pretty rainy winter, but do you think that there's price sensitivity going on and that people are cutting back their use because of the high cost of electricity right now? Um, you know, we, if we drill down into the load trends month by month and, um, you know, juxtapose that against average uh, monthly temperatures, we could maybe track that, ask that question and, and do some um, discussion and answerings. But I would say that it's probably too quick for me to just react off the top of my head. Um, but I think that, you know, I could note that as a hmm, something for us to explore. Um, taking a step back and just putting some context and please remind me in the um, budget variance discussion, looking at these levels of trends uh, do and should inform our updated projections when we put together budget forecasts and reforecasts. So um, a good question as far as uh, usage trends and um, price sensitivity and uh, also what kind of impact weather patterns have on usage. <laughs> Um, but I can't answer that question specifically, Donna. That was a long answer to say I can't answer that off. No, 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 that, that's no problem. I, I just, it's like almost an intuitive answer. Like, is there elasticity of demand? And when the prices get high, do people just almost, um, you know, by nature start to cut back? Um, no problem, no problem at all. I think it's something to look at. Jeff sounds like he's got a... Yeah, just, I mean, given that we're looking at the first, you know, the, the basically the second half of 2022, the weather trend that I think might be affecting some of this is the fact that we just didn't have that massive heat wave we've been having other past years. Oh, maybe so air conditioning was so. In other words, I weather think we had nearly the load we've had in past in past falls, and so because we're not even really looking at at, at January numbers yet here. Yeah, um, right, you're so right. Sort of, you might see something there. Um, I find in my day job, I find that that um, winter heating loads are actually much larger and much less variable. <laughs> From year to year than summer cooling loads. Okay, thank uh, you. I mean, I I will I will not geek out any more about that, but that's just my no no no. Out. Thank you. That's helpful, John. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, amazed by uh, the comparison between December of 21 and December of 22. Yeah. Uh, more yeah. than more than double the revenue, and you know we I know why that is, but <laughs> wow. What what a difference! I know, and also had not um, specifically teased out, but you know, keep in mind um, uh, rate changes too. But uh, you know, definitely looking at the the dollar value of um, December to December. 
Yes, exactly. Well, that's great. Thank you so much. I don't mean to distract the conversation. We can continue along. No worries. Just taking down notes as folks are asking questions as well. And so, you know, flipping then to the expenditure side of our financial picture, cost of energy being the lion's share of our overall expenditures, what are we seeing year to date um, on our actuals versus budget and the monthly trends um, going back the last 13 months? Um, year to date cost of energy expenses are $13 million over budget or 9% over year to date budget. Um, you can see the months of September and December had the highest energy expenses uh, greater than budget. Um, and, you know, we recall that in September, we had the um, September heat events and um, higher natural gas prices definitely were impacting um, in December. So this is a big picture of zoom out. Um, Fiscal year 22-23, the current fiscal year, our Q2 financial performance, so our year-to-date performance with six months under our belt. Um, on the uh, left-hand um, portion of the chart, we have our actuals um, year-to-date uh, compared to our budget year-to-date. Um, you can see the third um, column shows our variances, uh, favorable or unfavorable and how much our actuals are year-to-date as a percentage of the year-to-date budget. Um, on the right hand of the chart, we have the full year, full fiscal year budget, um, and then uh, a year-to-date actual as a percentage of the full year budget. Again, just uh, slicing and dicing where we are given our actuals to date compared to our budget to date. Um, and then on the right hand side, you have a, a view of what our budget is for the full fiscal year. Um, starting from the top, again, we looked at the month by month detail where our electricity sales are um, slightly under budget, uh, $5.4 million or um, about 2% under budget. Um, and again, really driven by uh, our residential sales being 4% um, uh, below um, on the load side. Um, when we click over to our operating expenditures uh, in the middle of the page, you can see that um, our cost of energy is almost $13 million um, over our year-to-date budget um, through the first half of the fiscal year. And um, we have uh, savings in um, uh, the remaining line items of our operating expenses, um, again, through the first six months of the year that um, mitigate some of that overage on the cost of energy. Um, overall, however, our total operating expenses are $8.9 million over budget. Um, so uh, about 6% over budget year to date. What does this mean? Um, if we go down to the bottom line, our uh, change in net position where we're taking our revenues, less expenses, um, adding in our non-operating income, interest uh, earnings, expenses, um, and other non-operating um, income line items, we have an actual change in net position of $47 million on the very left-hand side here. A, a healthy um, addition or change in our net position by um, six months into the year. Um, it's below budget. Uh, it's $15 million below what our budgeted change in net position is um, of $62 million by the halfway mark in the current fiscal year. And this compares to what we had budgeted for the full year. So over to the very right-hand side of the page, in the budget column, our change in that position we had budgeted for the current fiscal year um, is $74 million. Let me pause here and see if there's any questions before moving on to the next page. Okay. And this is just zooming in onto the bottom line, our change in net position, year-to-date actual versus budget. Uh, year-to-date net position, again, as I mentioned, is healthy at $47 million, however, is under our year-to-date budget of $62 million. 
um, where we're projecting or I'm sorry, not projecting, budgeting for a change in that position by fiscal year end of $74 million. And again, the, the high level takeaway is higher than budgeted cost of energy expenses, particularly in the months of September and December, driving um, those expenditure overages and softness in revenue performance that we've had year to date um, that are dampening that uh, change in net position that we're actually experiencing versus our budgeted expectations for the first six months. Um, what does this mean as far as cash position? Um, we track cash position. One of the things that I, you know, want to emphasize is our cash position, we typically um, report out on uh, at year end. And um, this is our cash position as of December 31, so halfway into the year. And a um, calculation approximation of the day's cash on hand that we have, one of the metrics that um, we have uh, adopted uh, a reserve policy where our minimum is to maintain 180 days of cash on hand, 180 days of um, operations on hand. Given our cash position at the end of uh, December, um, we have 200, almost 220 days of cash on hand. And this is based on um, a forecast of our operating expenses for um, the current fiscal year. Again, we you know, look at this once the fiscal year is closed to say, how did we actually end? What were our actual operations? And how many days of cash does that, um, is that equivalent to given where we end the year cash position-wise and how much we spent in operations? Um, let me pause there on um, the uh, next um, section of our discussion is um, we have our view of uh, financial performance through December 31, 22. Um, and this is the um, first half of the year. We uh, put a PCE rate change into effect on um, February 1st. And um, have a projected impact on uh, fiscal year end, given what we know today of our actuals through December, um, a rate change that went into effect in February, and then um, some adjustments given our actual performance to date um, with one half of the year under our belt. Um, I'm sure everyone wants to go into that, so let me take a, a quick pause and come up for air and see if there's any questions. Thank you, Christina. Does anyone have any questions uh, on the data and material that's been presented so far? Okay, it looks like I see none. Um, why don't we'll take comments from any members of the public at the very end of this item? Is that okay, Christina? That's great. Uh, Donna? <clears throat> yes. Do yeah, I this, see this isn't a question, just a request. Sure. Um, uh, in the future, could we get these PowerPoints posted online the day of before the meeting so I can, I double screen, so I have your presentation up on one side and then I have the, the, the notes. Uh, yeah, so if you could please send these to at least put them on, I just went online to see if this was on and in the past, um, we have had them online so we can just, or on, on the website so we could look at them so. I, I appreciate that because I like I like to refer back. So that's thank great. You. Nellie can drop it in because I'm in the, I'm looking at the same thing. It goes yep. it goes from the December 31st results to the May Mayor report, correct? Page 15 to page 16. So we can just pop that in between. Yep. No worries. And um thank that's great, Christina. That's um I think it's just a we probably won't have this problem going forward because we're going to be meeting in person less online. And you can always just bring everything with you if, if there's extra copies of things. Um, but uh, for those who are participating via online, that's great. Well, thank you, Carlos. Yes. Um, so Christina, go ahead and we'll move on to the next um, item. Sure. So item five, um, projected impact of the February 1st PCE rate change on our um, year end results. Um, again, the caveat here is we have actuals through December and um, we have a PCE rate change and um, our projections uh, include our um, 
actual performance and um, some adjustments to what remains for um, the second half of the fiscal year. So in words, uh, the PCE rate change that went into effect um, is projected to generate uh, a $56.9 million positive variance in revenue when you compare that to the adopted budget for the fiscal year. Um, the rate change underpins a projected change in net position at the end of uh, the fiscal year of $114 million or $40 million more than the original budget change of $74 million change in that position. Um, also included here um, in the year-end projection are uh, a couple items that um, I spoke to in the prior section of presentation um, that we've included. Um, so one is the actual financial performance year-to-date through December of 2022. And then um, additionally, given the softness in residential loads, um, a load forecast adjustment in the second half of the fiscal year to reflect um, load performance that we've experienced in the first half of the year. So the residential loads being down 4% um, compared to budget and then commercial industrial um, you know, at budget. Uh, cost of energy expenses are forecasted to be above budget for the second half of the fiscal year, about 8%. And that's really taking that average of the first six months of the fiscal year and um, uh, adding that into our uh, projections or updated projections for energy expenses in the second half of the year. And um, our remaining expenditures for the organization are projected to be at the monthly budget forecast for the second half of the fiscal year. So this is um, also important to note we have uh, six months of actuals, and then we have the uh, projected monthly budget forecast in the remaining line items of our um, of our overall organization budget. Um, so clicking over to a zoom out view of what does this mean? Um, here we have our, on the left-hand side, the fiscal year 22-23 adopted budget. Um, where you can see the $367.7 million in um, budgeted revenues for the fiscal year. Um, we have a total operating expenditure per, uh, budget of $294 million for the fiscal year, and then a change in that position of uh, almost $74 million that we'd budgeted. And again, remembering that we've adopted this budget back in um, May, June of 2022, and, and much has changed since then. So um, I talked through what are the important items that we've incorporated into this forecast. So um, overall, you can see that the 2-1 rate change um, on top of an adjusted load projection for the second half of the fiscal year uh, is projected to end uh, with 420. 4 million in um, uh, forecast revenues for the fiscal year, um, a $56.8 million positive variance to budget. Um, on the expenditure side, um, uh, highlighting the cost of energy trends that we've seen and the adjustments made, um, the cost of energy is budgeted at $264 million and forecasted uh, to be $287.7 million uh, by fiscal year end. We you know, forecast that we will be wrong, but given what we've seen thus far and um, uh, you know, making updated projections, we uh, forecast potentially a $23.5 million negative variance to the adopted budget. So bottom line impact, given all of those items that we've adjusted for and our actuals to date, um, a projected change in that position of $114 million, uh, so potentially a $40 million variance from our adopted budget. Again, we have six months under our belt, six months to go. Um, uh, much will change, but given what we've experienced thus far and how we're adjusting the remaining uh, forecast for the fiscal year, this is the um, updated view that we'd like to share with you all. Great, um, thank you. So I'm gonna go ahead and open this up to questions from members of the committee. Yeah, I'll start, this is Carlos. Uh, what what drives the, um, 
the $23.5 million variance um, in cost of energy, given that we have power purchase agreements, um, is that just, and, and it's it's not related to our not understanding PCIA or, or those increases, because we already know those, right? So is that mostly our uncovered position that requires us to then go to the go to the markets to purchase what can someone help me understand yeah, that? The, the um carlos the cost of energy has um many different line items our um uh, contracts are you know pretty set but there is variability in line items of cost of energy that are really driven by the cost of electricity at a certain period of time and how much we buy and um, maybe how much we're netting in terms of um, our pluses and minuses on the cost of energy. So while we do have a good sense of um, some of our uh, contractual costs, uh, we do have exposure to what is the, 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 the market price of energy and how much are we needing to purchase and secure, um, how much in credit are we getting overall that net effect um, particularly in the months of September and in December where we're seeing where we saw um, really high um, uh, day ahead market prices and real-time market prices that were just multiples of um, you know what we were budgeting or or forecasting right so it's our open positions it's our it's our I mean we what it's it's whatever we don't have under contract now is is that the bulk of the of the of where this variance comes from that we're saying it, it is um i can jump in there a little bit thanks jen um it's not i mean we we don't have an open position really we um you know we're we hedging hedge. <laughs> yeah we hedge um as per our policy um what we're seeing is that the um the cost of so there's multiple pieces that go into it so when we deliver electricity to our customers, we pay what's called the DLAP price, which is the, the ISO's price for uh, delivering electricity to San Mateo County, or it's PG&E's price. And then we also get credited for where we input electricity into the grid for all of our projects. And those, those track similarly. So if the, if the cost of energy is going way up, usually, the, uh, the price that's paid at the node where we're putting electricity into the grid also will go up, but it may not go up as, as much. And then we did hedge, but um, it turned out, you know, when we, and, and we hedge, you know, quarterly, um, the last few hedges that we've done, the price that we had to pay for those hedges was more than what we had expected we would have to pay. So that also increased what our um, cost of energy was. So, um, I mean, if you look at the prices of energy in the market, they're, they are ridiculous. Um, I, can, I can look right now to what the prices are in the ISO. Well, they're more reasonable today. They're about $47 right now. Mm -hmm. but, but in the past, you know, like last month or in December, you'd look and on a winter day, the, um, you know, the hourly price would be like $200, which is ridiculous for, uh, well, it's never been that high before. So, so prices were really affected by the big increase in gas prices, mm -hmm. but we did, we did hedge, but as you know, there's always a bit of divergence between what we forecast our load is going to be and what the actual load is going to be. And so we're subject to the difference between day ahead and real time prices. And it's just, you know, it was just really high and, and we're seeing prices staying really high, which is why Christine is projecting for cost of energy that it will continue in this trend for the rest of the fiscal year. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yeah, that helps. Thanks. Hmm. Thank you, Jim. And, you know, this this 2-1 rate change, this is the, the mid-year rate change, the January 1 significant PG&E rate change that um, we uh, changed our rates based upon. There is a, um, a projected um, PG&E rate change come March 1st, a very small one. 
Um, it's uh, affecting mostly T and D, uh, T and D transmission and distribution, as well as generation rate changes. Um, given this rate change, um, our uh, staff recommendation is to stay the course and not change our rates after this 2-1 rate change. Um, the uh, PG&E rate change that is projected um, March 1st is uh, 0.2 cents per kilowatt hour. So um, foregoing and not following that uh, PG&E rate change um, or if, if we were to follow that PG&E rate change, it uh, is projected to generate an additional $2.2 million over and above um, the, this uh, projected impact of the 2-1 um, PCE rate change. So overall, um, staff's uh, recommendation is to stay our current course with the rate change that just went into effect um, given uh, you know, customer impacts and um, uh, continuing on. All right. More questions, Carla after Carlos. Anyone else? Um, All right. Shall I move on to the discussion framework for budget variance? Let's do that. Yeah, we don't. These don't require any action. Um, I believe it's just sort of the reports were made to the committee. Consensus was built, and that's it. Right, Jan? I don't. Or and Christina, we don't have any. Formal no actions, yeah. correct. Okay, perfect. Great. And and really this all ties together. There, there are items for discussion identified by different numerics, but it all comes together. And um, this next section is a discussion framework for budget variances. So we see, we discussed um, the Q2 variances, um, our actuals versus budget to date. Um, we've identified and discussed um, the 2-1 PCE rate change and what that means for our projected year-end position and can see some of those variances, positive and negative. And, and what do we do with it? Um, how do we discuss this? What are the actions that we as an organization take um, or not take? Um, and uh, again, this is uh, the framework that I'd like us to think about it or that we have been working and thinking and doing um, things as an organization to address these variances, um, but really anchoring that in, um, you know, what, how can we look at these um, items uh, over time? Um, how do we look at the nature of such variances and what kind of tools can we utilize to address variances? So again, just key considerations as we um, revisit our uh, variance reporting timing. Um, the timing of our budget uh, development and, and projection, what's the timing for adoption, and what's the timing where we're comparing our actual performance to our budget or our projections is, is really key and important. Um, you know, we look at the revenue side of our equation, the expenditure side of our equation, and we have positive or negative variances. Um, and we have uh, variances that may be one time, they may be structural. Um, how do we address those items? Uh, how do we address the nature of these variances? Are they things that we can just weather or um, things that we need to adjust? And what are the tools that we currently use and what else can we develop and use to address such variances? Um, I, I think that's right. Oh. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Keep going. No, no, no. Go ahead. Keep going. Um, so on timing, uh, we adopt an annual budget, and in each June, our board adopts uh, the next year's snapshot of expenditures, revenues, and our projected change in that position. We also adopt um, four additional years of financial projections. They're a snapshot in time based on our best estimates and our best assumptions and, uh, you know, are frozen and we compare ourselves against that logic and uh, the expenditure and revenue projection as the year uh, passes. Um, and again, very fundamentally, when we started off our um, first presentation, our forecasted loads and our forecasted rates, you know, are the fundamental basis for how much money are we expected to have in a particular fiscal year and over multiple years in a multi-year forecast. 
And on the expenditure side, our, our costs are really driven by the cost of energy, a point in time view that's assessed quarterly um, and reported on um, in these uh, quarterly variance reporting periods. Um, and discussed obviously internally and um, at the Audit and Finance Committee and, and larger level. Um, the nature of our variances, you know, if it's on the revenue side or expenditure side, there are favorable and unfavorable variances. On our revenue side, um, what our load forecast assumptions are and are we performing um, to budget, below budget, above um, on our load forecast, and what is the reason and rationale for um, our forecast and assumptions and variances from them um, as time passes. And then on the rate side, um, our PG and E generation rate um, that our uh, um, PCE rates are modeled off of and PCIA rate assumptions, um, rates the big rate change typically happens in the middle of our fiscal year in the January, February timeframe. And we've adopted our budget and made our best estimate of what that rate trajectory um, would be, you know, nearly, uh, you know, nine months prior. Um, on our expenditure side, the cost of energy, again, is the lion's share of our expenses. And there are significant market fluctuations that might be seasonally or weather driven um, and other external factors that swing um, our cost of energy significantly that we might have not uh, known about. Um, and then our ability to expend our uh, remaining budget at a pace that was projected. So given these favorable or unfavorable variances on the revenue side or the expenditure side, looking at them and saying, are these one time or are they structural? And if they're one time or if they're structural, how do we shift our underlying assumptions? Do we shift our underlying assumptions? Um, it's, it's something that we ask ourselves as we're tracking our actual performance um, month by month, quarter by quarter, and informing any uh, budget refreshes or uh, budget reprojections. So tools to address these variances, again, as the Audit and Finance Committee, you're seeing the snapshot every quarter, every three months, and uh, there are many tools that we can utilize to address the variances. Um, the first one is time. I think a wait and see approach uh, or a do nothing is a tool. It's, it's an approach. Um, other items, regular variance reporting, where we're seeing what our variances are, discussing them, trying to understand what contributes to them. Um, we can utilize our cash position to mitigate any um, unfavorable variances on the expenditure side of the house or um, on the revenue side of the house. We can uh, budget contingencies um, in particular line items where we have more variability and exposure. Um, we could mid-year adjust budgets. I believe PCE has done that in the past when expenditures were coming over and there was a need to um, adjust uh, uh, budget projections mid-year. Um, we have multi-year financial forecasts that we adjust every year when we are um, adopting our budget and the multi-year financial forecast and can and do sensitivity scenario planning. Um, how much tolerance do we have to changes in particular items um, in our overall financial picture? Um, that provides us a range of what could uh, the financial picture be when we're projecting out multiple years. Um, we have rate changes. Uh, we have a current rate setting process and rate making process. Um, and we could, uh, you know, change rates differently. Um, we could uh, institute a rate stabilization fund um, a rate setting framework that might be different from what is in place today. There are a number of tools that we utilize and tools that we could um, think about um, implementing in the future or just see what the positives and negatives are to uh, help us weather um, financial storms, um, uh, create a solid financial picture, um, ensure that we continue to have a solid financial picture, and all of this is to say that, you know, PCE has been and continues to be in a um, overall solid uh, financial picture. Um, and there are tools that we utilize and there are tools that we could 
develop further um, and think about, you know, what's the added value? Maybe it doesn't make sense um, for us to think about um, and act on. Um, really, this is just a, a dot, dot, dot to further discussion of PCE's uh, budget development process, the next um, quarterly variance reporting. Um, the next audit and finance committee meeting is May 8th, um, 2023. And scheduled for that meeting is the Q3 variance reporting, as well as um, the first look at the um, budget for fiscal year 23-24, and then uh, the four-year uh, multi-year forecast um, beyond. Let me pause there and see if there's questions or comments. All right, once again, I'll open this up to colleagues um, to see and if there are any questions, and then we can take public comment at this time too. I don't see any members of the public joining us, but we can still go on record as asking. Um, okay, Jeff. Um, do you want just questions right now and come back for a round of comment? Because I, I, I have something like, I'm more I, interested I think in the we can. I think we can do questions and comments right now. We're, okay. we're not running that. We have plenty of time. Okay. This is a really, really interesting uh, presentation and discussion because, I mean, it's sort of, you're, Christina, you're presenting it as budget variances, but it's really, I mean, it's really looking at our risk as an organization. Mm -hmm. um, and coming back to Carlos's earlier questions about the costs, I mean, you know, I think I've said this before, the, the biggest risk in my mind to BCE is basically volatility of both demand and price. Um, and, you know, you, you asked is, you know, are these, are these variances structural or one time? And the reality is they're both. Uh, they're structural in the sense that they're, you know, these, 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 the, the, the power cost variances are not going away. They're just going to get more and more frequent, but everyone's going to look a little different because it's going to be dependent largely on weather events. Um, I, I, I said there were no extreme events in the fall, completely neglecting the September heat thing. And I was just looking back, kind of trying to refresh my memory of what actually happened. It was, what's interesting is we didn't actually use that much more energy locally because the we were we were less extremely affected but i think what happened was that because the rest of the state was so so drastically affected when we did have to, or when we had to hedge or when the dlap prices went up they went up much much more than they would normally have gone i mean we didn't buy that much more and we couldn't charge any more for it but we were paying a lot more per unit at that point because of the demand everywhere else um more so than here so we have these i mean i mean this is we're talking about it in terms of budget, but it's also really a, a conversation about our strategy in the long run. You know, how do we shelter ourselves from the volatility? I actually think that, I think what we're doing is actually really, I mean, I think, you know, in terms of becoming a 24 seven time coincident greenhouse gas free LSE, we are to some extent insulating ourselves from that. I think the more we rely on, on sort of on storage in particular, and the more we could possibly rely on things like demand management, we can we we can't avoid the volatility, but we could blunt the effects of it. So, I I I don't I don't know that I have any specific action items, but this is a really interesting discussion. I'm actually I'm really interested in looking forward to, to the May eighth discussion further because it's sort of it's you know it's sort of talking about in terms of budget numbers, but the reality is it's sort of how do we actually manage what's becoming a bigger and bigger risk to us in the long term, just sort of operationally in terms of strategy. So, so thank you. Thank you. Do you want to respond at all to that, Christina? Yeah, I think you know, Jeff, I am definitely fitting within my specific wheelhouse uh, the the framework of budget variances, but I think that you're. Um, hitting the nail on the head where it's like we have tools to address variances that are representations of risk. It's quantifiable risk financially. And um, there are various tools that we could utilize to, from a financial standpoint, buffer ourselves from that risk and what's the range of a risk that is tolerable that is, you know, we have to make sure that we have sufficient cushion for the once every year, once every five year kind of event, and what's the magnitude of that? But I think you've, you know, expanded it beyond like the financial terms that I'm really trying to keep it, uh, you know, honed in on. But it is much larger as far as 
um, the organization's uh, identification of, of, of risk and risk mitigation. Again, my lens here is very selfishly focused from a financial view. And there are many things that, that address that, but also have a larger um, little r risk, maybe big r risk uh, way of corralling. But the, but the financial terms are a really useful um, sort of metric and analytic for the bigger term strategy. So it's, I mean, it's like you're, you're yes, the financial terms, you're, you're limiting yourself to the financial impacts, but they become sort of, you know, I mean, you know, we probably just have to live with a certain amount of budget uncertainty in budgets, which is probably the last thing you ever want to see. Um, well, the last thing any of us want to see, but it's sort of, you know, anything we do to address budget variances becomes kind of a proxy for how well we're dealing with the overall risk to the organization. So it's, I mean, it's, it's yes, it's limited and I'm, I'm talking about something bigger, but it's a really, I mean, the, the budget variances are a really important way of evaluating our responses to those bigger risks. I totally agree. Again, really interesting, sorry. Yep, no, totally agree. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we have Carlos. Yeah, um, so I, you know, unfortunately, because it, means we have less money to spend on on um other activities um i mean the, the response to this perhaps is that we really should look at um our our reserves and you know how how, how strong our reserves should be indeed to um address you know sharp increases um, or, you know, significant variances and perhaps, um, you know, historical analysis is helpful um, to look at these markets. And, and it, I mean, it, it really is, I mean, we are, we are um, so dependent on, you know, the weather that it's really hard to understand um, what's coming in the future. But, you know, perhaps it means looking at our reserves and saying, well, we actually need to have more than 180 days, or we need to have, you know, X, Y, or Z. And, and we're we're in a position this year where we can do that, it looks like, from from um, where we're going to end up. But yeah, I think it may be an, another reserve question. Agree. Um, I'll, why don't we see what Marty has to say, and then we can, again, have a continuing discussion. Uh, Marty? Are you unmuted? Unmute. You have to unmute Marty, I think. Is Marty unmuted? Can anybody hear Marty? Marty, we're not able to hear you. I believe Director Medina might have fallen off the call. I see him still here. And he just can't, he can't get the, do you want to, Marty, I can see you're unmuted right now, but we can't hear you. Do you want to type something in the chat and then we can um, have Nelly report out your comment? Okay, why don't you do that? And then I'll um, I'll go ahead. I, I agree, Jeff and Carlos. This is um, you know, this is really the crux of the business, and risk management is the one of the primary fiduciary responsibilities of the financial committee and the executive committee and the board. Um, it's really an interesting conversation to me because I'm hearing a lot and I, and I'm sure I have a feeling this is what Marty's going to be talking about a little bit too. I'm hearing a lot from people who are opening up their energy bills and, you know, they, first of all, still don't realize peace peninsula clean energy is their energy provider. And I'm hearing, oh my God, did you get your PG and E bill? You know, it's crazy. And how much everything costs and all that. And there's a lot of, um, you know, especially for low-income seniors and even middle-class and, you know, even, even, even people who, you know, really just stretched to, to, you know, live in this area in whatever capacity they have, um, you know, it's starting to, it's starting to really, the bill size and the amount of payment for energy is really starting to um, affect people in the pocketbook. And so there's also, to me, a little bit of a balance of how much do we need in our 
reserves and, you know, what part of that, how do we, you know, sort of walk, walk the line between risk management and keeping money in, in our reserves and also providing the most cost-effective service that we can to our customers and, and, you know, balancing what do we need in reserves and what can we get back into the community and how do we get it back? I see that we were, um, we still had about 2 million that we had budgeted to get into programs that didn't get into programs. So, you know, adding more money into programs doesn't necessarily seem like it's the answer um, because in some ways we still can't get it all out. Um, so these are just more my observations and comments. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Nellie for a minute here, who's going to, I think, help with um, Marty's comment. Yes. Uh, Director Medina's comment says, do we have insight on what other CCAs are experiencing? Are they similar? Are there unique situations that we could mimic? Great question, um, Marty. Great question. So um, I'll let Jan and Christina um, and Sean respond to that or C-suite. I think, um, you know, doing a, a, a comprehensive look and comparing ourselves, running comps to other CCAs um, financially definitely makes sense. It's very much on a look back basis. I mean, you know, here we are at middle of the year and sharing this information. Um, so, you know, doing that kind of scan of where are our sister agencies and how have they performed on a look back basis, we could definitely do. Um, and thinking about what can we learn from our sister CCA agencies, um, we, we definitely are doing so. Um, you know, the, the establishment of our at least minimum days cash on hand is, is industry standard. Um, thinking about, well, what's the right place for us to be in? That question really comes back to us and it comes back to what are, what are our strategic priorities because there's, there's limited resources and we have to prioritize and having that conversation um, is, is really important for us to do. Other CCAs have, you know, I don't know where they are in terms of their strategic priorities and how they're different, but that's kind of the nature of who we are, where we're serving our community and saying what's important to our community and um, having those values play out in those strategic objectives and then further play out in what we've identified financially and what we're willing to tolerate risk-wise. Um, I, I can add more here. And one of the things that uh, we haven't done, um, which other CCAs do, is we have kept, uh, we have not changed our policy regarding our rate discount. So since we started in 2016, we've had a 5% rate discount. Other CCAs go up and down. They change that all the time. Sometimes they are the same uh, as PG&E. Sometimes they're 1% less. They're, they're like all over the place. And I think we we talked about this, we've talked about this in the past, and I don't remember exactly what the amount is um, per percent, but um, well, if our revenues are about, I don't know, I don't want to do it offhand, but it's like, I think that's like five to $10 million um, range for each percent that we are less than pg e but don't hold me to that number. And we've had that conversation with you all and we've agreed that that's a priority for us to maintain that 5% discount. So, you know, they may not see the, the losses that we had over the last two years because they raised their rates. And we decided that we had sufficient reserves that we would go ahead and have a loss, but that would still leave us over our 180 days cash days cash on hand. So um, I'm not suggesting we should change that at all, but that is one of the differences between us and the other CCAs. Sean, did you want to add anything? I, I was exactly going to ask Sean, if you have anything you want to add here too, that'd be great. You know, I really don't, um, other than to say that um, there is a practice out there, not not practice across the across the CCA um, community, but the rate stabilization 
set aside within within reserves um, has been a practice of some CCAs that we may want to look at. But in general, what I really want to appreciate is um, and dig into further with the team is, you know, Jeff's discussion of structural, um, managing structural risk uh, and, and all that this serves up. So um, no, I think what Jan and Christina have offered is good. And I have further questions for our team later on. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, Jeff, again. Yeah, um, I was going to just add, well, to go back to Marty's question, I, I'm going to assert something and, and staff agree or disagree with me. This, I mean, our, the 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 24-7 um, greenhouse, you know, time coincident greenhouse gas free strategy, differences between us and their CCAs, we are doing that. And I think, you know, it's leadership just in terms of being greenhouse gas free, but it's also, a, you know, I think it's not that being time coincident 24 seven necessarily makes us, you know, makes us more immune to risk. It's that we have, we're considering and managing our future um, energy procurement in a way that I don't think any other CCA is. Um, and so just the fact that we're having this, that we're, we're developing that strategy and the tools for managing that strategy puts us in a really, I think, unique position where, you know, we're, we, we are taking more control of our our energy sources than any other you know any other entity I think possibly on the planet, um, and so in terms of just managing risks like this, I think I think other CCAs are going to be looking at us um, in terms of how do you you know how do you manage you know how do you manage the risks of a grid that's sort of becoming more constrained and situations that are becoming more volatile. So again, I mean it's an interesting discussion for us, but I think it's a discussion that's going. I mean it's it's like we're we're way out ahead of this as far as I can tell. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Jeff. Um, I mean, we, when we looked at the 24-7 and uh, there was one slide in there that showed the risk, uh, the risk premium, and that going to the 99% time coincident had a lower risk than our current strategy. Um, so, and the, the idea that we're, we're going to try to schedule our power to every hour to match our load, whereas now we we and others don't necessarily do that. We the power some power just comes in when it comes in, and we have no control mm -hmm. over scheduling that. But our philosophy, our objective is to schedule it all. So we'll see. We'll see if that's better. But it should be. It should be better, as you're saying. I'm sorry, Sean. No, no, no. I just wanted to to raise my hand there and say I also think um, that the 24/7 implementation alongside the cost of service study is going to be um, very illuminating for us. And I know we are getting started on that now. And so these two things are tracking and we are, um, and I know this because I've been in all of the meetings really beginning a much more concerted focus on procurement rate management um, and uh, sorry, risk management. And you'll hear more about that in the future. But I do think those two things going forward, the one, the one thing, Jeff, um, and this would be interesting to hear from you because you're you're in the business. The one thing that gives me slight pause is, you know, the availability and the te technological readiness of battery storage, long duration battery storage, because that is really essential to inoculating a bit um, on these market swings. So that's all yeah. I'll say. But it's interesting. It's an interesting problem and mm. uh, one that we're aware of. I, yeah, and I'm just following that. I'm seeing sort of short-term uncertainty, but I mean, most people who follow that field closely from what I can see are, are actually optimistic in the long-term that battery supplies. I mean, the bottleneck isn't the materials, it's the manufacturing. Um, and we're seeing, I mean, like the market is responding to some, some extent. So, I mean, we're, you know, it takes years, but factories are actually being built to, you know, and, and, you know, and frankly, you know, expanding beyond China, um, we're sort of embarrassingly dependent on China for battery manufacturing. But I think that's changing just because people are recognizing that there's money to be made in, in making lots and lots of batteries. I think the long the long term outlook's good. Um, the other tool we have would be demand management, um, and I'm seeing really interesting, still seeing really interesting stuff out there on virtual power plants, which is still just it's there's just not enough. 
as far as I can tell, it's still the Wild West. And when you talk to people, you know, the handful of people I talk to, they're actually trying to manage VPP projects within service territories. They still don't know what to do with it. Um, I don't think that'll last forever. But um, again, it's it's just it's I don't you know it's I don't there's just it's too it's it's really still this sort of balkanized industry that doesn't seem to be. But I think it's again I think the long term outlook on on both of those things is actually really positive. And I agree that those are I mean those those two tools might turn out to be really important tools for managing this risk. So um, it's just I mean I could talk about this for way longer than you want to hear me talk. But um, <laughs> I think it's a really good discussion. John Keener. Uh, yeah, I agree with Jeff. Really good discussion. Um, I have a question that is unrelated to any of this and possibly unrelated to the uh, to the budget itself. But um, do you have any news um, on our bond rating? Um, our bond rating, we are currently rated in the BAA two category with Moody's, um, similarly with um, in, in the B AA with Fitch. Um, and that is uh, one of the items that I'm, you know, spearheading and working on um, as far as uh, relationships with a rating agency analysts that are assigned to our credit um, and providing that uh, positive information on um, financial picture, um, overall uh, PCE's credit profile. Um, really planting and growing the seeds of, uh, you know, moving for an upgrade on our outstanding rating. Um, so that's definitely in the works in the next uh, several weeks uh, to month or so. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I, I think this is a really, um, um, I agree, really great uh, conversation here. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead. I, I still don't know if I see any new members of the public, but I'm going to go ahead and for the record, open this. Oh, I do see Dave Morrow's in. A few couple of people have joined us. So I'm going to go ahead and open the um, conversation for uh, public comment right now. If anyone has anything they want on either item five or six, we'll take both those together since they're kind of tied. I'm just going to take a quick look here. All right, I don't see any, and Nellie, it doesn't seem like anyone sent anything in to you. Sorry, no, there has been no comment submitted to me. Okay, great, okay, fantastic. Um, I'm gonna just open it up one last time for anyone on the committee that wants to make any closing remarks or comments, because I believe this is the last item on our agenda and the next item is just committee reports. So um, anyone else have any closing comment they want to make? Okay, seeing none. Um, well, I, for one, certainly appreciate all the hard work, Christina, um, Sean, and Jan that has gone into this um, analysis. I also appreciate the thoughtful conversation and um, especially when it relates to kind of the realities in which we're all sort of living um, and how we're doing our best, but we're never going to be um, able to perfectly forecast and the variances will always um, be there. And so now as we build a longer term track record, the lessons learned is a great um, way to continue to think about how to improve Christina. So thank you very much for that work. Um, with that, we'll move on to item seven, which is committee member reports. Um, does anyone have any anything from the committee they'd like to to do a report out on? Okay, well, seeing none, um, we might wrap this meeting up 20 minutes early. Uh, has everyone please um, encouraged their colleagues on the board um, to think about applying or um, where, you know, where do we stand, I guess, Christina, on getting a, uh, a new colleague on this? Are we pretty close? Are we, um, do we have anyone who's interested or do we need to make some phone calls? Um, I am not aware of anyone that is interested, um, but we could uh, make the ask and shake the. Yeah, let's let's do that. Let's send out an email. Um, maybe wait till we find out where we where we stand with the executive committee, which I think might be full. But if we could could um, put out an ask again for anyone who's interested, um, to tell them we have one seat open. Um, and this would be a great committee for someone who's new to the board to join. 
Great. Mm -hmm. Maybe especially encourage that and let them know what time the meetings are and maybe the dates, just so that if people are working, they can see if they can clear their calendars. Yeah, Donna, we have a lot of new board members, so we can make the ask at the board meeting to see okay. if anyone might be interested because, uh, I mean, Nellie can talk more about the, the yeah. change that we have in our, our board, but. Perfect. Be, no, leader. that's great. Whatever the process is that you guys want to follow is fine by me. I think it's just, um, and it's no hurry, but it, it sure would be nice to have another voice on here. Absolutely agree. Yeah, we'll, we'll put that on the board meeting because I think at this board meeting, a number of the new members will be there. The first and time. Maybe there are some with some financial background too that might be helpful members of this committee. Great. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point, Jan, that financial background is helpful, but not necessary. Right. You know, anyone who's just interested in learning more, this is a really good, you know, kind of put into the committee work that um, is not too onerous. So thank you. All right. So then we will reconvene those of us who are on executive committee at 10 a.m., Jan. You betcha. All right. <laughs> we'll see you all in uh, 20 minutes. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Donna, for sharing this. <clears throat>